sharing a song with you today that I wrote quite a number of years ago, but I was just, it came to my mind today, and it's, it's a Magnify the Lord medley. Sing it with me if you want. Magnify the name of the Lord. Magnify the name of the Lord. For He is worthy, worthy to be praised. Magnify the name.
I'm excited once again about what we're going to be sharing on today. We are in the eighth week of a series that we are calling Signs of His Coming. Now, the first seven are all out on that Zoom link, and I think they've been posted online too, where you can, I think you can just go see them. Uh, Life Church of Salinas dot O-R-G. Okay. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to read quite a long passage this morning. I normally don't do that. I just take a text and then we go and we talk. But <clears throat> you need to hear this. So understand what we're talking about today. The theme of what we're going to be dealing with today is the Roman Empire rebirthed. This is Signs of His Coming, Part 8. From Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, now he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. And behold another beast, a second like to a bear and it raised itself up on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth and devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool and his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. I beheld then and the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man 
came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and brought him near before him. They brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed." I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints and the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name today that you open the eyes of our understanding. My eyes, Father, even more. All of our eyes, Father, that we understand the day and age and times that we are living in right now. We're seeing the prophecies of your word fulfilled, Lord, in our lifetimes. And the days are short that we have ahead of us, Father. If we looked at a clock, we would say, it is just seconds until midnight. And Father, we're just asking you to help us today to understand, help me to share and explain. Give us an anointing, Father, to share and to hear and to receive. And also, Father, to retain. To retain, Father, what we hear, what we understand by your Spirit that it may make a difference in our daily lives. And I ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, that you may be glorified, Father, through your word and by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, you may recall that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and Daniel interpreted it. It was this big like statue type thing and it had a head of gold and arms of silver and had brass and the legs were iron and so forth and then the feet and the toe, uh, pardon me, the toes were, were a mixture of iron and miry clay. This was 14 years after Babylon had fallen Oh, pardon me, I said that wrong. This was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and that image was 14 years before Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. He had a dream of his own under Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar. Daniel had a dream of his own that adds to and expands our understanding of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. These four beasts that he said came up from the sea, each different from the other, represent the same four, the same four earthly kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dreams and Daniel interpreted and we, of course, we've seen history, we know what they are. Babylon, Medo-Persia, or pardon me, Gre yes, and then Greece, and then the Roman Empire. So, this time, however, it's the character of the kingdoms that is being revealed in Daniel's night vision. Nebuchadnezzar's dream which we read about in Daniel chapter two, demonstrates how man assesses the kingdoms of this world. They're majestic, they're impressive, they're powerful, they're gigantic, they're overwhelming. But in Daniel's vision, these kingdoms were shown as savage beasts of the jungle. This is God's appraisal of those for Gentile kingdoms, that they are divisive, they are destructive, they are angry, 
They are cruel. The visions were different, but they were both given for the same purpose to show Daniel and you and I as God's people what was and is happening in the world. Israel was in a desperate time in their history. Assyria had conquered the Northern Kingdom in 722 BC. And now 200 years later, the Southern Kingdom of Judah, I said, I think I said Southern Kingdom a minute ago, Assyria had conquered the Northern Kingdom in 722 BC. And now 200 years later, the Southern Kingdom of Judah is in captivity. Mm. In Babylon, and if you were a Jew in those days, living then, you may well have thought that Israel was finished as a nation. Through these two dreams, these revelations, God was assuring his people that this was not the final chapter for them. That there was a time coming in the future when God would again use Israel for his purposes. But he wanted them to know that he was in charge of everything that would happen. So he told them in advance, only God knows the kingdoms of the world. And he gave them to Daniel when Babylon was in power and spoke and said that Medo-Persia would replace Babylon and Greece would replace the Persian Empire and then the Roman Empire would overcome Greece and be the ruling power in the world. All right, now, much of what has, was revealed to Daniel has already happened. The first three kingdoms have come and gone. And the fourth, the Roman Empire, certainly made its appearance. But Daniel's vision included additional information about the fourth kingdom that was not mentioned in Nebuchadnezzar's dream other than that the toes were clay and iron. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. I want you to look at this fourth beast because the Roman Empire is not totally finished. Let's read from Daniel 7, verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now I want you to notice that Daniel is very careful to explain that the ten horns are ten kings that shall arise from this fourth kingdom. Look at the 24th verse of Daniel 7. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are tens, ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. We know that this 10 kingdom prophecy is still in the future because <laughs> not only has no 10 kingdom form of the Roman Empire ever existed to date, but such a kingdom has never been suddenly crushed either. As the Bible indicates, this kingdom will be. So we know it is yet to come. Now, according to Daniel chapter two, the Roman Empire in its final form will experience sudden destruction. The Roman Empire of Jesus' day, the one that we call and think of as the Roman Empire, did not end suddenly. It gradually deteriorated and declined over many, many centuries until the Western part, what they called the Holy Roman Empire, fell in A.D. 476 
and the eastern part, the Byzantine Empire, fell in A.D. 1453, almost a thousand years later. You can hardly imagine a more gradual slide from glory into oblivion. We understand then that some form, and I, th I don't think this is news to any of you who have read your Bibles, we understand that some form of the Roman Empire is going to emerge in the end times and will be in place, according to Daniel, immediately prior to the return of Christ to rule over the earth and all the nations. Believe it or not, it was Winston Churchill. Most of you know who he is, if you're not too young to know history. It was Winston Churchill in 1946, following the devastation of World War II, that said, and I'm going to quote what he said. He said, the tragedy of Europe could only be solved if the issues of ancient nationalism and sovereignty could give way to a sense of European national grouping. Quote, well, not yet. He said the path to European peace and prosperity on the world stage was clear. This is the quote, we must build a United States of Europe, end quote. He said that in 1946. And on March 25th, 1957, just 11 years later, the European Common Market, often called the EEC, European Economic Community, today most people just call it the Common Market, was born when six nations signed the Treaty of Rome the birth of the common market in Europe. Today, the European Union is composed of 27 nations with a combined populace of over 500 million people, replacing North America as the world's largest economic zone. In 2002, 20 years ago, 80 billion coins were produced for use in the 12 participating states of the Eurozone, introducing something that today we call the Euro, right? Y'all know what the Euro is. Since then, the Euro has steadily increased in value. It goes up and down like our dollar, but the dollar has declined compared to the euro. And there's a lot of expert economists that are predicting that the euro may eventually replace the dollar as the standard world currency. Now, I hope I'm not boring you with all this. Slowly but surely, the nations of Europe have come together, creating a modern replica of the ancient Roman Empire and as we track the movement toward increased unity and more centralized power among the European nations, we can see a new empire in the making. An empire that occupies virtually the same territory as the ancient Roman Empire. Now I should point something out to you. Israel was part of that old Roman Empire. It was controlled by Rome, but it's not currently a member of the European Union. The EU has considered for many years Israel to be ineligible for membership due to what they call human rights violations. Those supposed violations are based on Israel's occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and even East Jerusalem. Because this 
other part of the world would like to see these things returned to what they consider the rightful owners, but Israel can show you from God's word that areas that they are been given by God to occupy. It's been proposed. Now think about this in terms of the seven year peace treaty. It's been proposed by the EU that if Israel would sign a peace treaty with the hostile neighbors that keep shooting rockets in, it would be offered membership in the European Union. Mm hmm. So, looking at Daniel chapter 2, the toes, the iron, and the clay, it's intriguing to know that the iron in Nebuchadnezzar's dream represented the strength of the old Roman Empire. But then Daniel chapter 2 in, says in this new empire that the iron in the very end of it, the iron will be mixed with clay. Clay is nothing like the gold or the silver or the brass and the iron that composed the rest of the previous empires in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Clay speaks of fragility, of weakness. The final form of the Roman Empire will be composed of very diverse ethnic, religious, and political elements. Now we can already see that in the present European coalition. The EU now has tremendous political clout, economic clout, but the cultures and the languages of its member nations are so incredibly diverse, all of them speaking different languages, or most of them, that it cannot be held together any more than iron and clay. Uh-huh. Unless unity is imposed upon them and enforced upon them by a very extremely powerful leader. I'm going to read you a long passage again from Daniel chapter 7, verse 19 through 27. We stopped at 18. Now I'm going to go on with 19. Listen closely. It refers to that leader that will consolidate the power in the revived Roman Empire. He says, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse or different from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron. Remember the legs, iron represented Rome. Whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, Rome, and shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. This has never happened in history so far. The ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the most high and he shall subdue three kings. 
and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of a time. Most of you know that means three and a half years, a time, a year, times, two years, dividing of a time, half a year. But the judgment, thank God, the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That was a feeble amen. One person, amen. Did you hear it? The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Amen. Praise God, that was better. So, what we see, and I'm going to start heading towards wrapping up. Since the time of the Roman Empire, there has been no nation or empire to govern or dominate the whole world. But it is coming. In our not too distant future, there will be a period of time that the whole world, the world, were not accepted. The whole world will be unified under one dominant, powerful leader. The fourth beast represents the Roman Empire. However, since we know that Rome was never ruled simultaneously by 10 kings, we know that these 10 are yet to come. That they will rule over what we would call a newly formed empire that overlays the territory of the ancient Roman Empire. So today, the concentration of power in the European Union signals the beginning, if you will, of this new world order. According to Daniel's prophecy, a supreme leader will arise from among the 10 leader confederacy in Europe to take control of the new European Union. He will become the final, final, last world dictator. We know him as the Antichrist. Read your Bible, the beast. We'll talk about him more in weeks to come because there's much to say about him and his reign. But the point you need to grasp today is that the European Union is one of the conditional things, a prelude, if you will, to the coming of the Antichrist. We're living in that day. And I know some of you may say, well, but wait a minute, Pastor, that doesn't compute. The uh, European Union is composed of 27 nations, not 10. Well, that's a good question if you're thinking that in your head. And I cannot state exactly how the transformation will take, me play, take place, but let me tell you just a little. I was studying just yesterday how the Un European Union is governed. Currently, the European Union is organized into three bodies, a parliament, the Council of European Union and the European Commission. I'll give you some details real quick. The Parliament is considered, quote unquote, the voice of the people because citizens of the EU directly elect its 785 members. The Parliament passes European laws in conjunction with the Council and they have a president who is elected to serve a term. 
used to be five years. I'm not sure if it's five years today. They keep talking about changing these things, but most of the stuff they've been talking about for 10, 15 years, they've never done. Okay, the second part is the Council of European Union, which is considered the voice of the member states. It consists of the heads of the governments of the 27 member nations which are in the European Union. This body works with the Parliament in the passing of laws and establishes common foreign policy and security policies and the president of the council rotates every six months. So it's a constantly changing, moving thing. They've wanted to change that for years, but they never have. And then lastly, we have the European Commission. It consists of 27 commissioners whose tasks are to draft new laws and implement policies and funding and the president is nominated by the Council of the European Union for a five-year term. So, if you doubt that a leader could arise and consolidate such power in a short period of time, I will try to remind you how easily glib statesmen and charismatic politicians can gravitate to high office. I'm not going to even talk about right now because we've talked about it before and we'll talk about it again, what's happening specifically in our world today, in our nation and other nations. But let me give you a quote from a fellow by the name of Paul Henry Speck. The first president of the UN General Assembly, first president of the European Parliament and one time Secretary General of NATO, I want you to listen very closely to what he said a number of years ago. He said, we do not, and I'm quoting, we do not need another committee, we have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. <sighs> Had you heard that before? In Daniel 9, 27, we read about a treaty that will be signed between Israel and the world leader who will head the realigned Roman Empire. You all know about that, right? Seven-year treaty. Well, I'll read it to you out of Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Seven days equals seven years. And in the midst of the week, three and a half years, time times and a half a time, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So Daniel tells us here that Israel will sign a treaty, not knowing he's the Antichrist, find a treaty with the Antichrist, that this treaty will be designed to last for a week, literally in prophetic language, a week of years or seven years. This treaty will be an attempt to settle the Arab-Israeli controversy that has focused the whole world's attention on the Middle East for years. And after three and a half years, the treaty will be broken and the countdown to Armageddon will begin. As I look at world events today through the lens of God's prophetic word, I cannot help become, but become acutely aware of the warning signs. And I've already given you seven messages on signs of his coming. I'm not going to rehash all that today. 
But I want to say this, warning signs are only useful if people pay attention to them. Did you hear me? I remember in 1980, you remember the Mount St. Helens blow up volcano situation? Many people were warned and many left and many didn't. People died because they did not heed the warnings. They said, oh, how would they know it's gonna, a volcano is gonna go off or whatever, and they stayed right where they were and they died. Warnings are only useful if you listen to them. So Romans 13, 11 comes to my mind, New Testament. This is Paul, he says, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Knowing the meaning of the events that we see in our daily news, what's happening around our world, helps us to understand not only what's going on in the world, but some of those things are extremely prophetic. Daniel's prophecies show us that things are coming to a head. Israel is now back in the land, right? We talked about how important that was. 1948, a prophetic fulfillment. The nation became a nation in Israel again for the first time in a huh, thousand years or 2,000 years. I mean, it was just crazy. Oil has called, caused the whole world to focus on the Middle East. And the nations of ancient Rome's empire are reuniting. They are. The hands of the prophetic clock are moving toward midnight. Events are moving us toward the moment when warnings will be too late. Did you hear me? My question for you this morning is this, are you heeding the warnings, you personally? Are you prepared to stand before God? Are you ready if the rapture was to occur today? that you would be caught away because you're living ready, prepared for that moment. Have you accepted the offer of salvation that God has given us through Jesus Christ? He's telling us by the events that surround us that the window of opportunity to prepare to be ready will soon close, will soon be gone. So let me close by saying the warning has been sounded. I'm sounding it again today. You, me, all of us would be wise to heed the warning. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? For the last few weeks, I've been giving people, and I know the church is mostly believers, but I've been giving a pe our people and those that visit and those that are here and those that hear this by, you know, the internet, I'm giving you an opportunity to get ready if you're not ready. Today, if you're here, and I want every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, please. I don't want to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to come to you. We're not going to call you out. But if you're here today and you're not sure you're ready, I'm gonna pray a prayer in just a moment. I'm gonna ask you to repeat it after me. But if you need to be praying this prayer along with everybody else that prays it, if you need to commit or recommit your life to Jesus Christ today, could you just slip up your hand and put it right back down again? I see several hands around the building. Thank you, thank you. Recommit yourself to being ready, to living daily with Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. What everybody, and Christians, don't say, oh, I've been a Christian for years, I don't need to pray this prayer. I want you to pray it 
to give holy boldness to those who may need to be saying the prayer and recommitting or committing their life. So be bold in praying it out loud. Christians, everybody here, whether you raised your hand or even if you should have and you didn't, pray it, mean it, God will change your life right there where you are. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name. I come to your throne asking forgiveness for all of my sins. I repent of my way of life. I want to change, but I need you to change me from the inside. Create in me a new heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me, one that loves you and serves you and wants to do your will. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Please, Father, wake me up spiritually. Don't let me be sleeping. Let me be aware of these end times that we're living in. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Rule in my life, Holy Spirit. Direct me, Father God, by your Spirit that I may live a life pleasing to you. And if Jesus came today, I would know I'm ready because I've committed my life and heart to him. And I thank you for doing it, Father, for answering my prayer, transforming my life in this moment. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.